Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 22. We're going to look at a, a familiar fellow in your Bible. It may say the rich young ruler, the, uh, the rich young man. Verse 16 says, And behold, one came to him, him being Jesus, and said, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, Why do you call me good? There's none good but one, and that is God. But if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, Which? And Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> the young man said unto him, All these I have kept from my youth up. What do I lack? Jesus said to him, if you will be perfect, go and sell what you have and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The word of God for the people of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you, Lord God, today. We thank you, Lord God, for... We thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to come before you, Lord. To stand, Lord God, and sing praise to your great and holy name. To give to you out of what you have so graciously given and entrusted us with. And now to hear your life-transforming word. We ask you, God, to speak to our hearts today, Lord. That you would even prepare our hearts right now to be good ground for your word, God. We ask that you would give us, Lord God, courage and a wisdom to apply your word to our lives. That your name might be glorified by our living. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. You know, um, this, this guy that came to Jesus asked probably the most important question a human being could ever ask and need to get answered is, you know, how do I, how do I get eternal life? Essentially what, essentially what he was asking is that, uh, look, you know, how, how can I get to heaven? How can I, how can I, what can I do to you know, make sure that when I leave this world, I go to heaven and I can be with, with you in paradise forever, Lord? Um, how can I get eternal life? Most important question that could be asked, how can I get to heaven? Uh, this question is, uh, was asked by the Philippian jailer, if you remember, when Paul uh, knows that uh, Paul had been put in prison, well, in jail, in, uh, in Philippi, and the Lord, you know, Paul and Silas at midnight, they were singing and praising, and the Lord shook the doors open, and um, they didn't escape, and again, the jailer um, well, thought he was about to kill himself. He thought that um, they surely were gone and he was going to be in trouble. And Paul's like, no, you know, do yourself no harm. Here we are. And the man asked in, in uh, Acts 16, 30, he said, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? That was, you know, that is, that is the central question that you and I must have asked before we leave this earth. Um, you know, how can I be right with God? You know, there are many important questions that I ask in life, but there's none more important than how can I ensure that I am right in your eyes, God? And it is a question Job's friends asked that question. His friend uh, Bildad, when he was talking to Job, when Job was going through his trials and tribulations and his friends came to so-called comfort him and things like that. And in Job 25, verse 4, his, his buddy asked him, he says, how then can a man be justified with God? Uh, how can he be clean that is born of a woman? He says, you know, and what Bill Dad was acknowledging is that, you know, man, we're sinners. You know, how do you, how, do you, how do you make yourself right when you're already wrong, right? How do you fix yourself up? People who ask this question in the scriptures, they realize then, uh, that we all share one common reality, that we, start, we don't start this life, you know, um, just don't mess up. We start this life already messed up. And we need to be fixed up. That's why Jesus said that we must be born again. Right? That we must be born again and must be born from God. That the people in the scriptures understood that as human beings, we have failed to accomplish the one ultimate mission of our existence. And that is to glorify God with our lives. 
That's the ultimate. You know, sometimes I talk to people like, I wonder what my purpose is. This is that look. When you, sometimes when you talk about purpose, you're thinking about function, right? You're thinking about I'm supposed to kind of my activity. I should be doing this, and I should be a butcher baker, a candlestick maker. But the ultimate purpose of your life is to glorify God with your living. That whatever you're doing, whether you're the butcher, the baker, or the candlestick maker, that in doing that, you are always glorifying God with your life from your heart. And, with, and your activity doesn't take away from that. Romans 3.23 acknowledges that we've all failed in regard to accomplishing our one central mission. For all have sinned. That's me. That's you. That's grandma. That's granddad. That's everybody. Right? That's the most religious person or the irreligious person. For all have sinned and fallen. We all fall short. We come short of God's glory. Come short of glorifying him because we've sinned. Right. So the question, the question of, of how can I do with well, this man as Jesus, he says he, he acknowledged that, you know what? Yeah, I've sinned. I messed up. I guess he's acknowledging that because he says that what good thing must I do? So he's, he's assuming as many human beings would like to assume is it has to be something that I can do. And to make myself right. But the reality is that what, what Paul tells us here is that once we've, once we've fallen short. We've all sinned. And that word sin, I've told you in the past, it's an archer's term. You know, it, 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 it depicts the man who's pulled back his, his, his arrow on his bow and he's let it fly. And he's missed the mark. You can't unmiss the mark. Right. You know, we've sinned. We have missed the mark. We can't unmiss the mark. And what Christ does is he comes and he hits it for us. He hits it bullseye. And then he offers it to us through faith. Yes. Are you with me? So, in that sense, you know, this guy, you know, in, in verses 17 through 19, you know, Jesus asked the man, you know, uh, you know, why you call me good? He said, well, look, you won't be perfect. He said, go keep the commandments and, and this and that. Um, you know, he gave him a whole bunch of commandments to keep. And the reality is that what we find out through this interchange between Jesus and this guy is that earning righteousness and earning salvation and earning heaven is impossible. It is impossible because we've already missed the, the we've already missed the mark, right? It is impossible to be perfect when you're already imperfect, right? If I've already sinned, then there's no chance for me to be perfect, right? And only the person who follows God's law perfectly could ever, you know, within himself deserve heaven. And the only one person that's done that is Jesus, right? The only one who's done that is Jesus. When Jesus tells this man, keep the commandments, right? You know, he should have felt insufficient. But instead of feeling insufficient or feeling, you know, you know woefully short, he kind of feels good. He feels, he, feels, he, feels, he feels righteous. He feels good about himself, right? He feels pretty good. He's like, I've kept all of these things from my youth. His pride rolls up. And pride is a dangerous thing. You know, we were talking the other day, Mark and Marie and I, about how, and, I, and we see it, right? Because Mark and I did jail ministry for years, and we go to the jail, and you get very little resistance most of the time when it comes to telling people that they need Christ, they need to be righteous. That doesn't mean that everybody surrenders, but they, you, get very little, you get very little pushback that they're good enough. Because they have a sense of knowing that I'm, I messed up. But when you get the trouble as we get people who have not gone, you know, have not had these problems and done things that are grossly wrong. And maybe if they have a little religion and don't let them be a deacon in the choir. Right. And they almost feel like, you know, I can do good things and I don't necessarily need Christ. And the pride of people causes them to resist. To resist the humility that's necessary to receive what God has for you. And God's pride, none of us are, are beyond the, you know, the, uh, the temptation or uh, the possibility of being filled with pride and arrogance. I told you in the past, some of the reasons why we get so offended when somebody messes over us or something is not just that they did wrong in general, messed up in God's eyes, but it's that they did it to, to me. I mean, me, you know what I mean? Me. That's the problem. That's the problem. Look, pride, you know, this guy's pride rolls up. You have to be well, beware of pride because pride is a destructive force. 
and it begins on the inside and it'll begin to work its way on the outside and tear your life down. I'll give you a couple, two scriptures I'll share with you real, real quickly. Proverbs 29, 23 says, a man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. So you can have a person, he's got honor, but if pride gets, sets inside of him, that pride will bring him down. It will bring you down. You have got to see yourself as, uh, as not worthy. I was telling Melissa, I said, look, one of the things I begin to realize more and more in life, right, is that if other people see you as, 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 as an elevated status, that's fine for them to see you like that, but you must see yourself as low. Are you with me? You must see yourself as, as low. Because when you begin to see yourself as high, then pride begins to take root and it will bring you down. Are you with me? Amen. Proverbs 18, 22 is another one. Before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty, is lifted up. And before honor is humility, right? See, God honors our humility because we, we should be humble. We should be people who are, are you know, filled with humility because after all, we, we've all sinned and missed the mark. Yeah. Right? We should not be people who are walking around with pride and arrogance because of the grace and mercy that God has bestowed upon us. Right? That God has made. We should all be able to walk around and whatever horrible thing we see people do, we should have it in our minds and hearts that not for the grace of God, there goes, that, there goes I. That any human being has the potential to be any human being. Are you hearing me? Right. That doesn't mean that we have to, uh, uh, to condone something, embrace it, but we need to understand in ourselves that it could be me. Yes. And we should, that's why God says our role is to love mercy, yes. right? To do justly, yes. love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Are you with me? Verse 20, the man has said to Jesus, all these things I've kept from my youth, what I still like. I don't know about this now, you know? I'm like... He, we have a tendency to, you know, to in, in inflate our, uh, our goodness, right? We have a tendency. I, th I wouldn't be surprised if this boy was inflating his goodness. Like, I've been keeping all these from my youth. He might have not have killed, but, it, but, maybe, but look, let me tell you something. Some of you, you say, yeah, yeah, you, I ain't killed nobody. But did you know the Bible says if you hate somebody, you got the equivalency of murder going on there, right? Because in your heart, <laughs> they could be gone and you'd be perfectly satisfied. Are you with me? Right? So I think that he, he inflates his, 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 his goodness a little bit, even uh, on the world, by the, from the world standard. So that's why I thought about this. I said, you know, most important thing, well, not most important thing, I guess I'll say that about a thousand things, but it's very important for us to be real with ourselves. And you can never be real with God. You can never be real, you know, with other people. You got to first be real with yourself. Right? And do you ever, like, get on yourself and say, look, I mean, you know, you are tripping, Right? I mean, or do you always, you know, you're always pacifying yourself and excusing yourself. And it's always, you know, like excusing whatever behavior. Because people are not always going to excuse you. People are going to look at you sometimes and they're going to call you for what they see. And you need to do the same thing to yourself. Are you with me? I've been saying it for years that, there, that sometimes we need to look in the mirror and we need to point out that man, that woman and say, you are tripping. And you need to get it right. You need to stop hollering at your wife. You need to stop being selfish. You need to stop. Are you with me? Yes. Right. You got to be honest also. You got to be real and you got to be honest about yourself. Even when you think about coming to church, you got to be honest with yourself and say, you know, what is my end goal here? Right? What am I trying to, what am I trying to gain from coming here? I'm getting the card punched, or am I trying to draw closer to the Lord, to learn more about God so that I could have a closer walk with him? I think that would be the only thing that's acceptable to him. Oh, yes. Are y'all with me? Right? Or am I just trying to get a blessing, you know, just trying to keep some blessings in my life for this or that? No. I mean, let me tell you, we, you know, we've been doing church for 20 some odd years, and in that time, we see people, you see a lot of different things. And you can ask Melissa, we've seen people come to church for many different reasons, right? People come to church, and we've, we've seen guys come to church looking for a woman. We've seen girls bring a bar from the church because they want God to fix him up so he could be nice to her. Forget about the relationship with you, God. Just make him be better for me. And we don't realize how horrible that is. Are you with me? Amen. What is the motive? You got you to think about your motive, right? 
And that motive at the end of it, it has to be to honor God, to glorify him, right? To learn more of him, to please him. Yeah. And then you got to ask yourself, am I willing to do what it takes? Am I willing to do what it takes? Because it takes effort. It takes effort. It takes intention to, you know, to live a good, solid Christian life. It takes some, you know, some effort. I mean, you're not going with the grain here. The, grain, the, the flow of the world is not taking you to strong Christian living, right? So it takes intention. I mean, you, you're not walking down here where it's all easy. You're going uphill. Are y'all with me? And you read in, uh, uh, there's, there's uh, several scriptures, but you read in Luke chapter 14, and I don't have it here because like I said, it's several. And Jesus talks about counting, counting the cost, right? Counting the cost of, of the Christian life. There is a cost associated with it. There are things you got to give up. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, str a struggle and a sacrifice and things like that that go along with it. But the reward is greater than any you could ever have. Amen. 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 This man talked the talk. Doesn't look like he was willing to walk the walk, was he? Right? Because uh, when Jesus told him what he needed to do, he went away sad. Right? He was talking all that good talk. Verse 21, Jesus said to him, if you will be perfect, if you will be complete, you won't be right. You won't be right. And Jesus puts him to the test. He knows exactly what's going on in our hearts. And so this is not about selling everything, you know, to follow Jesus. But this is what this man had stuff that he loved and, he, and it was going to come between him and the Lord. And Jesus said, you know what? You won't be right. Go sell what you got. Give it away to somebody who ain't got nothing. And come on, walk with me. And the man wouldn't. But what I see right here, what Jesus says is that we must be willing to give up anything that comes between a close relationship and a close, close walk between the Lord and I mean, us and the Lord. Anything that will come between you and God walking closely together, you got to be willing to give it up. You got to be willing to separate that, right? I mean, Peter and Andrew left their nest, Matthew chapter 4, verse 20, right? Jesus says, follow me. And the Bible says, and straightway they left their nets and they followed him. Because they know that we cannot keep doing what we've been doing and go and walk closely with him. And, they, and so they had, a, they had a decision to make, right? They had a decision to make. James and John left their father's business, Matthew chapter 4, verse 22. Jesus called them, and immediately they left, they left, they left the boat. They left their father's business. They left the ship, left their father, and they followed him. Those converts in Acts chapter 19, there were some converts. They practiced voodoo. When we in Louisiana, uh, we got we online too, so people not being, might be like, what is voodoo, right? Uh, you know, witchcraft or whatever like that. They practiced voodoo, and they left their, their practices in order to follow Christ. They put it all aside, right? Acts chapter 19, verse 19 says, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of everybody. Right? Because they, they had a decision to make. Right? I can't, you can't keep doing this and walk the closer to God. So they laid those, those things aside. And I've told you my story before that when I kneeled down on that, at that chair and I gave my life to Christ and I got all of these CDs, right? I got all these gangster rap CDs talking about everything but being a Christian. And I put it all in a bag and I threw it in the middle of the trash can because I didn't want the trash man to find them and then he go keep them, right? Because I figured if they're bad for me, they're bad for everybody. It was bad, right? But I threw it all away. I had to separate. I didn't keep it in. I ain't going to listen to it, but I'm going to keep it in the... No. Matthew Henry said this. He said, those that truly repent of sin will keep themselves as far as possible from the occasions of it. He says, when you truly repent of sin, you won't stay away from anything that's going to cause you to get into it again. Amen. Right? I, you know, that means you might have, sometimes you got to stop going to certain stores, you don't go to the store no more. If you got to stop listening to certain music, you don't listen to it no more. You do whatever, whatever it takes. Because at the end of the day, guys, we, know, it, you know, we will sacrifice what is, what, what, we will sacrifice what is less important to do what is more important. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Amen. We will sacrifice what is less important. So when, here's Peter and John, and, they, you know, and they're fishing, and Jesus says, follow me, right? 
follow Peter and Peter and Andrew. There he says, follow me. Hmm, now nah, they got a choice. Walk closely with the Lord, or let's keep our fishing business going. They dropped it and they follow him. James and John are with their daddy. They got this business. He's gonna die and they're gonna pass the business on to us. And here Jesus comes and he's got another plan. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna keep with the plan you had for your life, or you're gonna walk closely with me. They had a decision, and the decision was theirs. They sacrificed what they considered to be less important for what was more important. Amen. Same thing with you and I, right? Yeah. If you tell me you're a Christian, you say, I'll never read my Bible, I surely need to read my Bible, then what you're doing is you're sacrificing reading your Bible for something else that's more important. And you gotta think about it, is it really more important than learning God's word? Are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you, right? Look, I got a couple questions for you before I move on. Have you left anything? Have you ever left anything? All right. I can't imagine uh, somebody coming, beginning to walk with Christ who, who, who doesn't have to leave anything. Right? I mean, because we accumulate habits and we accumulate life, things in our lives. I'm not talking about just stuff. We accumulate, you know, ideas and habits and friendships and different things we do and, and, and entertainment. And when you begin to walk with Christ, it's born again. You're a new person. There are things that you're going to have to leave. Because that, that's the old stuff doesn't go with you. Amen. So the question is, have you left anything? Have you left anything? Do you need to leave anything? Do you need to leave anything? You think about that, and when I open the altar up for prayer, you come and let me pray for you for those things you need to leave, amen? Are you willing to leave anything to be who God wants you to be? Or are you willing to leave anything to walk closely with the Lord? That's the question. Because we will always sacrifice what is less important in order to have what is more important. Right. Always. Have you made any adjustments in your life to run a good, strong Christian race? Have you made any adjustments? Right? And so we get to verse 22, and 22 says, when the young man heard that saying, he heard what Jesus says, Jesus says, go sell everything you got, give it to the poor, come and follow me. And verse 22 says, when the young man heard it, he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. I like to hear sometimes some of the old preachers would say, his, he didn't have possessions, his possessions had him. They had a hole on him, and they, and they gripped him. And they wouldn't let him be who God wanted him to be. This man walked away, and I used to ask the question, was he insincere when he came asking Jesus, what should I do? Because sometimes people can ask questions, and they already got an answer in mind that they want, they want to hear. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Right, a husband, you better know it, you better know it. You know, might say, uh, you know, am I, am I looking, you like the way I look at you? Watch yourself, tread very carefully. Amen. Amen. You got to know, some people say, look, you, you like these shoes? The lady's good with that. Men ain't like that. You know, we ain't like that. If a lady asks you, you like the shoes, you like the shoes. If you don't like the shoes, and you say you don't like the shoes, they might be mad with you. Right? Sometimes people ask questions and they already have an idea in their mind what they want to hear. Right? This man asks Jesus, what should I do to gain eternal life? And he already felt that he was doing good stuff. And so he's ready for Jesus to talk about these commandments. And when Jesus said it, he's like, I got it, right? Because we have a tendency already inflating and overvaluing our goodness, right? But then Jesus says, that's not enough. You gotta give yourself to me, right? He said, go sell everything you got, everything you worked for, everything you inherited, whatever it is, this life, this stuff that has brought you comfort and peace and life. Get rid of it and come walk with me. Everybody has to give something up. This man walked away from eternal life. You believe it? He's not the first. And sadly, he probably won't be the last. I, want you, uh, I think I got the scripture. There's a lot of... Uh, uh, words. John 6, 66 and 68, I got that? All right. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And Jesus said to the twelve, will you also go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou has the words of eternal life. It was this scripture right here 
that steeled my heart to walk with the Lord forever. And I began to walk with God in 1990, and then uh, for about a year or so, and then backslid for a few years. And when I made a recommitment to God, and I got off my knees and re repented of my sins and recommitted my life to Christ, it was this, John chapter 6, is where the Lord led me to go. And when I saw that, because I walked away, right? But I wanted life. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted what he had. And when he brought me to this, and I read those scriptures, and Peter said, where shall we go? Because people started walking away from Jesus because he was challenging them, right? And, it, and Jesus was like, y'all going to leave me too? And Peter was like, we, well, how are we going to leave you? You got what we want, right? And so when I, when I got off my knees that day, I was like, Lord, I will never leave again because what I want is eternal life. I want that closeness, and you have it. Where else can I find it? Are you with me? Jesus didn't give the man the answer he was looking for. Right? I can, I can think he wants Jesus to tell him how good he was. Right? And some people, look, don't be like that. Don't come to church like this man. Don't come to church and always need to be affirmed and always need to be you know, lifted up and always need to be strengthened. Sometimes we need to be corrected. Sometimes we need to be rebuked. Sometimes we need to be challenged. Are you with me? Right? Come to church and say, Lord, speak. Right? Don't tell God what to say. Just say, Lord, speak to me. Are y'all with me? Right. This man had an idea what he wanted to hear. He wanted Jesus to tell him how to be great. Instead, Jesus told him how to become great. He wanted Jesus to tell him how to be righteous. And Jesus told him how to become righteous. Are y'all with me? We got to just let God speak to us. And uh, when, when Mark told his, uh, his uh, version of this, this encounter, Mark said that Jesus looked at the man in the Gospel of Mark. He said, when the man said, Lord, what else do I lack? Jesus looked at him and loved him. And because he loved him, he told him the truth, right? Because he loved him, he told him the truth. I try to always say what, I, what, I, what I'm believing that God is saying because I love you. And if I just lie to you and just try to fill up the church and make you feel good, that would be so horrible. I'll be doing it for me, all right? But I'm, I'm, I'm sharing and trying to teach God's word accurately for you, amen? So, let me conclude. The questions uh, I began to think about with the, the rich young ruler is that was he insincere or was he just unwilling to do what it, what it took? That's why I titled, entitled today's message, Is It Worth It? Or was it worth something? I don't know. I mean, we, y'all got it. Y'all wrote it down. I changed the title you know, myself three, four times. Be like, no, it is. But sometimes I got to scratch it out here. I got to scratch it out here because I changed it on the thing there. That's the most challenging part of a message for me, coming up with a title, right? Was he, was he insincere or was he unwilling? Was he just fake right out the gate? Or, did, or was he, was he kind of serious? And then when he found out the sacrifice it took, he was like, look, man, I ain't in it for all that, right? Let's read a few scriptures together before we, uh, we go. Turn with me to Mark chapter 10. I want to read. Uh, I want you to see this scripture as I close. But it was, a, it was a lot to try to put on. It wouldn't fit on the screen without making it real tiny. Mark chapter 10, verse 28 is where I want you to get. Mark chapter 10, verse 28. You know, was this man just phony and fake out of the gate uh, uh, did he just conclude that it wasn't worth what he had to give up? You know, there's an old Christian saying that goes, he is no fool who gives up what he can't keep to gain what he can't lose. Hmm? He is no fool who gives up what he can't keep this life to gain what he can't lose, eternal life. Are you with me? He who has begun a good work in you faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's why Jesus calls us to give up ourselves. One day you got to give it up. We can't keep it. As sure as I stand here and live, one day I will not be standing here. I'll be dead. You will die. Right? Why hold on to who I am when I can't keep it? 
the, the, the saying says that you're not a fool to give up you because you can't keep it. To give it up to gain something that you cannot lose, which is Christ Jesus. What's your separator from the love of God? Right? So persecution. So, you know, nothing, right? Distress, nothing. Are you with me? Mark chapter 10, verses 28 through 30. Then Peter began to say to him, see, we have left all and followed you. And Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there's no one who has left house, a brothers, a sisters, a father, a mother, a wife, a children, a lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold Glory. now in this time. Glory. Houses and brothers and sisters, mothers, children, lands with persecutions and an age to come. Eternal life. Eternal life. Are you with me? Hallelujah. Jesus is the one. He's the answer. He's the answer to every issue, the solution to every problem, the source of eternal life and abundant blessings. All that's required is that close walk with him that begins with faith, faith in Christ and walk closely with him. You have to sacrifice some things. You got to give up some things. But listen, I talk about it like we listen to music, right? And we, we, we Christian music, you know, people we believe, you know, and look, we don't want other stuff in our hearts causing this, this walk doesn't need to be any harder than it is, right? And as a Christian, you know, we don't have the options of, of, of the, the, the music that the world has, you know. Remember the narrow road, Jesus described the Christian life as a narrow road, right? So the you know, options are limited because it's narrow. Right. And so sometimes we just got to recycle and, and, and play songs over and over again. But that's just a part of it. Yeah. That's just something we're just going to have to do in, in this life to make this Christian life work. Are you with me? Yeah. Right. We ain't getting jealous and envious of no op uh, options that, sin that people have that are, that are non-Christian because we are committed to the Christian life. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. And, it, and, and sa those, that sacrifice is nothing. It is worth it. Yes. It's more than worth it. Are you with me? Yes. I, what, I, what I'll suggest you do sometime is begin to go and do, do some little Google searches. Now, it's easy. Now, you just do Google searches and go look up Christians in Sudan and places like that and see the sacrifices that they have to go through for Christ. I'm talking about life and death type stuff. I'm talking about torture. I'm not talking about a little just, you know, not doing this or that. The little stuff we call, you know. The stuff that we that we compromise with in America, you know, that's not even on their radar there because they are fighting for their lives. Are right, you with me? You got places where they will meet like this and it is a danger every time they gather. They are in danger of being killed. Are you with me? But they can they consider it worth it. They consider it worth it. And what God wants from you is the same thing he wants from them. He wants a close walk. And whatever we have to go through, the, the question is, do we consider it worth it? Amen? Amen. 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 we we'll stop right here.